On Friday afternoon, UK time, the cricket family was shaken to its core by the news that Shane Warne, an undisputed all-time great and one of the most loved cricketers in the game's history, passed away suddenly at the age of 52. Over the next hour or so, we'll celebrate his life here in the studio and we'll hear from his Australia and Hampshire teammate Simon Katic, as well as Mark Butcher, who played against Warne on and off for well over a decade and shared a commentary box with him after their playing days. 708 test wickets at 25, one of the five wisdom cricketers of the 20th century, a World Cup winner in 1999. Phil, somehow as brilliant as his list of achievements are, as, as brilliant as his numbers are, listing them all out kind of feels inadequate in trying to explain his impact on the game and the people who love the game. Yeah, good point. The numbers are there anyway. The numbers are special enough, uh, but they, they only tell half the story, really. Um, most cricketers carry their numbers around with them you know, for, for fear of falling away into the abyss. You know, their numbers speak for themselves. Well, with Warren, it was kind of the other way around, really. Um, and, of course, what we've seen, this this outpouring, and I think it's also, it's, naturally, it's been a very, you know, difficult time for the game, and a lot of us are still kind of numb, but there's also, we, we should be celebrating the bloke here, right? You know, this shouldn't be too downcast a podcast if we can help it, because... Um, this is a bloke who, from the moment he got hold of a cricket ball to his final breath, lived his life exactly as he wanted to do. Um, no fear, no regrets, no turning back. Um, a straight line, not round and round in circles like most people, but a straight line. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of magnificence in that, right? So I think we need to try and celebrate that point now. Uh, everything he did, um, he did with an eye on the cinematic, if you like, you know. Um, there's, there's that kind of old idea that, imagine that there's a, there's a camera on you all the time, even when you're you know, cleaning your teeth or walking down the street. Warren had that camera literally on him pretty much all the time, but there's no cricketer that I've ever known in my lifetime who has been as comfortable in that space, in that, in that, in that spotlight. You know, he, he created that space for himself and inhabited it until the moment he he, he, he died, you know. Um, an absolute natural on the pitch, but a complete natural off it as well. Yeah, even choosing to bowl leg spin in the mid-80s is an expression of his personality in a way. And also done kind of casually, you know. He was he wanted to be an Aussie rules player. Yeah. He, he, he became a cricketer by accident. Yeah, Joe, I've was been trying to process and articulate what my thoughts and feelings were um, after Friday. And my conclusion always ends up being cricket was just so lucky to have him, to have a person he liked personality like that who drew so many people in so many people from the age of early 20s to 40s they all cite Warren as the biggest influence to them getting involved in the game and it was so much to do with his personality as much as what he achieved on the pitch yeah and there's no greater credit than that really to to, to bring so many people to the sport but but also the fact that he did transcend the sport in a way that no other cricketer that I've been aware of in my lifetime has, has done it and that was reflected in the messages that I got as soon as after he died from friends who've got basically no interest in the game probably don't know another player apart from Shane Warne and he is the name that that stands out and you know some of that is because of the scandal and personality around it but it is also because of the impact he had on in particular the English psyche that he just became <laughs> this cricketer to be feared and admired and loved all in one go which I think is quite a rare thing and that, certainly for me personally I mean i watched him at Lord's Test 1993 a week after the Gatting Ball uh, that was my second day of live test cricket so he has been basically omnipresent in the whole time that I have watched cricket and if you think of other kind of legends of the modern era like Lara like Sachin when they've stopped playing they've kind of just drifted away and it's it's they just stand they've almost now YouTube highlights and Crick Info scorecards whereas Warren is still everything he says is a news story uh the commentary, look, we, we can't all pretend we loved it, but also it was everywhere. And and you still, even if you didn't necessarily like what he was saying, you still listened. Um, and when he was talking about the art of leg spin in particular, but just cricket tactics, there was there was still no one better at all. Um, yeah, so it's that kind of shock that he's just not there anymore. Is is quite a it's quite a shocking thing. I've never experienced that for someone that I didn't know. I'd I'd never even Phil's interviewed Warren a couple of times. I I never had the chance to meet him, but. 
to feel that for someone you haven't even met is quite quite an odd thing. I remember I had a mate called Karen, uh, who I don't see anymore because she was a friend of an ex-girlfriend of mine, but we, we were good mates for a few years. And she didn't like cricket, had no interest in cricket at all. But whenever she saw me, she'd always say, first words, bowling Shane. <laughs> first words, she never watched a minute's cricket in her life. But, you know, post 05, it so seeped into the national consciousness, if you like. And he was obviously the ringmaster. He, you know, he directed that that summer, even in a losing cause. Well, I mean, nobody lost. Nobody lost that summer, you know. And he was the, the orchestrator, the conductor. The omnipresence that you mentioned is really interesting because um, he he made those headlines, and a lot of, a lot of the things he'd say, people would say, were were slightly ridiculous. But I think it actually stemmed from like a, a very pure love for the game. He like Phil, you wrote in your piece, he didn't want cricket to be entertaining. He firmly believed that cricket, as much as he loved it, was something to be enjoyed. And a lot of what he said stemmed from, I want people to enjoy it. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't understand uh, negativity. He didn't understand bowling dry. He didn't understand playing for a draw. He didn't, he didn't credit any of those instinctive and kind of inbuilt cricketing truisms that we've grown grown to to put up with all of our lives he just didn't he didn't grasp that you know cricket was a was a place of limitless possibility whereas for most people who play it and a lot of people who watch it it's a kind of slightly enclosed and awkward place you know a place where self-doubt is the most prevalent emotion that's had and safety first is the kind of the constitutional requirement if you're playing the game uh, well Warren flipped all of that pardon the pun he flipped the whole thing um, and uh, you, talk, you talk Joe about the, this idea that you know when when, when a Sachin plays his last shot something stops and then he becomes this kind of, sort of rather dry diplomatic figure I totally get that um, with Warren you're right there's like, Warren just continued just to just to sort of throb and thrum all the way through from the moment he started to right to now and of course to today and to tomorrow as well and and his legacy crap word but his legacy will live on until there is there are no more games of cricket to talk about it, it was only what a week ago that he was putting himself forward for the England test coaching role right I mean and that yeah. is <laughs> yeah talking about the kind of optimism and enthusiasm that that is not a role he needs that is he doesn't he didn't need the money he didn't need the hassle but he obviously still saw that as a challenge and thought well I can fix that I want I want to have a go at fixing that and that that kind of sums him up really I think a good 10 minutes at my club's um like winter curry meal was spent debating whether or not Warren being in the coach would be amazing or awful as a you know that's the power he still had even at 52 um uh, Joe, he was he was flawed. He was flawed in many ways. He made high-profile mistakes that impacted his personal life, impacted his professional life. But the love shown towards him never really took a major hit. Why? Why do you think that was? Not many people could survive a lot of the stuff that he went through. Yeah, I think it was partly the way he dealt with those things. That there was never any sense of shame in particular. It was just well, you know a bit of a bump in the road. I'll just I'll just crack on, and it's quite hard to keep hammering a bloke who seems to be having a great time and loving it all. I, I think that's, I think it was that the positivity optimism that Phil talks about that really kind of carried him through there. And um, I think actually we've had some really good letters through or emails through over the last few days, which we're going to come on to later in the show. And one of them talked about, I can't remember which one it is, but we'll come to it. Who, who said he felt a bit silly having criticized Warren's commentary over the last few years and got a bit angry about it. And that really, that kind of touched the nerve with me because I felt, exactly the same in the kind of minutes and hours after his death like why did we even get wrapped up why did totally. we care like it's just totally and you know it was and it was a lot of it was down to showmanship and 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 playing up to that kind of partisan Aussie in an ashes battle and that's you know that's all part of the fun and we enjoyed criticizing him for it as well um but it, it was a good reminder not to take that stuff too seriously I think. It, it, it's a it's a great case study in how to deal with uh, the brickbats of modern life, the ridicule that comes your way, and that kind of the, the culture that tries to bring somebody down. Right now, you know, he made a thousand balls ups. Of course, he did, uh, and he acted stupidly and selfishly at times. And he would be the first person to acknowledge that, as he does in his book. But if you if you're authentic, then you can get away with just about anything. If you're inauthentic or if you have a kind of whiff of hypocrisy to you or if you have a sort of holier-than-thou 
element to your character, uh, then you'll get savaged. But Warren always got away with it because he didn't pretend to be anything else. He didn't. He did never denied his true nature on or off the pitch. And so, in the end, all of that stuff, all of that stuff, that, which kind of maintained the churn of the Warren legend, it just falls away. Just falls away, just like that, in, in the click of a finger. As soon, as soon as that, that news came through on Friday, suddenly it all felt just so so insignificant and yeah. all you remember is the greatness and i think there was i think the warmth from people who knew him far better than we did saw him on a sort of test match basis they clearly really did love him in a way that there are other massive names in cricket and i'm not going to mention them who it's kind of at face value everyone seems to like them but then you hear bits behind the scenes and, and they're not a very popular figure really you have to toe the line because they're powerful and you're on tv and all that kind of stuff no one has a bad word to say about Warren, apart from the stuff that you know he does. The he does silly things, but people actually, to a, to a man uh, and to a woman in that Sky commentary box, uh, seeing Isha's tributes, yeah. Bumble's tributes, yeah. they all loved working with him. Mm. There was no show in that. They they genuinely loved working with him. Phil, going back to to Friday afternoon, do you remember how you felt initially when the news came through? I mean, you you hammered out a, a beautiful tribute within like ninety minutes, but what you processed that very quickly seemingly what what were your initial feelings when you heard the news um it was funny being at the oval where so much of it happened and that's what i felt and obviously the shock is is immediate uh, but then uh, you look out there and it's not like you're just stuck in an office somewhere or in in your front room writing something or trying to create an emotion it's right there it was right out there and it and it felt very real and very very, very oh, I can't, feverish almost, you know. And I was here on September the 12th when he doffed his cap to the, to the, you know, to the corners of the ground, 40 wickets and 200 plus runs and still on the losing side, but the, the hero of the summer. I was there for that. I, I was, I've been there for, for other sort of valedictory end points of Warren's career. Um, and what struck me over overridingly was just suddenly how pathetic and small it has been to read certain things on social media in the last year or two about our oh, warns kicking off about this warns kicking off about that warns being too simplistic in his opinions about a cricket match and how people were kind of chipping away at the at, at the legend just for something to do and i think we we have that tendency and it, what struck me is just how quickly all of that stuff just fell away mm. and then you just remember the grandeur you know um and the, the guilelessness of the bloke as well. When I started writing it, that's what struck me very quickly or, or reminded me very quickly. You know, there's such a, there's a discernible human being in amongst all of that. Mm. Um, and then I, I remembered something from the first time that I'd met him, which I think was in 2006. Yeah, 2006, the summer of. So just before that, 067 final series you know which I was also lucky enough to be at but th that summer summer of 06 first time I met him interview for a magazine at the time and it was a cover story and it was quite a big deal for me because I'd only been in the job a year or so and met the bloke at Lords and I was one of the journalists with my 15 minute slot and we got that done and uh, you know I was quite pleased with it and I was going to scurry out the back the back door and it was one of these events where you have 20 or 30 kids, aspiring young leggies from London area, and he's going to pick out one or two and they might get a scholarship and get some sponsorship. And, you know, Mitre was sponsoring it. So it was, you know, that's kind of one of those junkets. Anyway, he was good as gold for the 20 minutes and he did the rounds and he was punchy about England getting stuffed, you know, imminently and all of that. And, you know, you wrote you, the, the urn is only on loan to you lot, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine it. Walking out back of the arena, back of the indoor school, walking around the back, and there he was, Warren, bent over, talking to a nine-year-old kid, just one solitary kid who was, I'll never forget it, leaning on his back, very insouciant, if you like, just little kid leaning on his back, looking up at Warren, who had lowered himself to the, to the lad's level, and Warren had a cricket ball in his hand, and he was dressed in, in bad-fitting whites, so I remember this as well, with mitre-sponsored whites. He was bent over, and he was just showing the boy how to bowl the leggy, and... And he had a fag on as well, Smoko, as he, as he called it to me as soon as the interview was finished. Um, and there was no one around except me, by chance, walking around the, the, back of the back of the school. And there he was, and this kid. And 
and I'll never forget that image. You know, this is this is Shane Warne, and it was just a bloke and a kid mm. just having a chat, having a chat about cricket, and the cameras were looking elsewhere, uh, and that that came back to me very quickly. Oh, th- sorry, ninety three came back to me very quickly. I was twelve, thirteen years old. Um, changed changed the game, changed my life. Mm. You know, that's not an exaggeration. Changed my life. I didn't go to school very much that summer, uh, and a large part of that was because of this this alien. Mm. who'd emerged from nowhere with a little bit of zinc on his on the front of his nose and suddenly it all just comes flooding back mm. uh, and it clears away all the stuff all the all the rubbish around it you know and then you, then you're just left with these unpierceable memories you know unbe- unbreakable memories Earlier this morning, Taha spoke to Simon Katic out in Royal Pindi about what it was like to take the field with Warren. That includes a touching bit about the reaction of Katic's son to the news in a great line where Katic says he crammed a number of lifetimes into those 52 years. Obviously, a, a difficult conversation. Um, but Shane Warren was a, was a teammate of yours in that great Australian side of the, the early 2000s. Uh, and you played together at Hampshire as well. Um, could you just talk me through what it was like to, to take the field with arguably the, the greatest bowler um, the game has ever seen? Yeah, I think it all started for me uh, meeting Warney for the first time. I played against him in Shield cricket and then got picked for my first Australian tour in 1999. And to go down to breakfast every morning and have you know legends of the game that I've been watching on the TV for the last you know five or six years or so. Um, you know, Warney was obviously one of them, the War Brothers, McGrath, all these guys, it was unbelievable. And I think um, Warney in particular, um, you know, I learnt so much from him and he had a huge impact on my career because of that association playing with him at Hampshire, but also playing with him in the Australian Test team as well. Um, and I think the other thing that stood out was that I know, because I bowled part-time leggies, um, <laughs> when we were in Sri Lanka for that first tour, you know, he took time and, and took me aside to teach me about the art of leg spin bowling. And, and I was only just learning at that stage. And, you know, a couple of those tips that he gave to me with my action, I kept with me in my mind throughout my whole career. And they certainly had a, a big uh, impact for me. Obviously I wasn't to the same standard as Warney, but I think, you know, his love of sharing that knowledge um, was second to none. I think, you know, it's already been said so many times that, you know, he was a legendary player, but from our perspective as teammates and mates, he was a legend of a bloke because he knew where you stood with Warney. There was, there was no grey, it was black and white. And I loved that about him. Um, I loved how, you know, he cared about his teammates. He was always very, very good to me. Um, he was also, what probably a lot of people don't know about him is that for those of us that saw him personally, and got to know him, you know, he was very respectful of our families or our, um, you know, friends or anyone that associated that would come to games and, and he got to meet them. You know, always saw firsthand at Hampshire how good he was with the young kids, taking time to have photos, sign autographs, all that sort of stuff. And I think that's what endeared him to people all around the world. So um, we saw that firsthand in Australia, but we also saw, I saw it firsthand in England uh, at Hampshire and then obviously touring with him for Australia over so many years. and. I mean, I could go on and on. The, the charisma, um, the fun. You know, he, playing with him, uh, he was a magnificent captain. Um, obviously, he didn't get that chance to do it as much for Australia as, as potentially he would have liked. But having seen him captain at Hampshire, you know, he made the game fun. He was always making, making the game move forward, whether it was with the bat or, or as captain or with the ball. Um, and, and, you know, he tried to bring in things that challenged us challenged us as um, teammates as well like we had a six hitting competition at Hampshire across all formats <laughs> because he wanted us as batsmen to put pressure on the opposition team and to take the game forward and I personally it probably wasn't my style as a player but I loved it because it put, took me out of my comfort zone and challenged me to, to start to be a bit more aggressive and in the end it had a, had a really positive effect so I certainly learned a huge amount from, for, um, you know, from him uh, as a captain as a player and as a teammate um, and I think, you know, yes, he's been taken far too soon, but we all know that he lived life to the fullest and he crammed a number of lifetimes into those 52 years and it was an absolute pleasure and priv- uh, privilege to call him you know, a teammate and a mate um, and he'd be sorely missed. And I guess from a, a family perspective, really you know, saddened and feel for um, Bridget and Keith, his mum and dad, and um, his brother Jason and then his kids um, 
Brooke Jackson in summer. So yeah. may he rest in peace, the king. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of emails come in and uh, one key thing that's come up with a lot of our sort of the English audience is the impact he had in that 2005 Ashes. He, you know, I can speak personally as well. He had a huge impact on youngsters who wanted to, wanted to bowl leg spin, even if they were supporting England. Um, you played in that series. Uh, England won it, but Warren was the star with 40 wickets. What are your kind of enduring memories of watching him up close in that, in that contest? Well, just the fact that, um, I mean, we'd spent time together playing for Hampshire prior to the Ashes and then after the series as well. And the thing about him was that he was just always up for the contest. He thrived on being the man in the big contest. And, and the Ashes, is, there's no bigger than the Ashes for Australia and England. So um, given the way the series unfolded, where you know, we got off to a great start, one at Lords, and then all of a sudden found ourselves under the eight ball, you know, well, behind the eight ball and the nuts, those couple of tests through the middle, you know, he was the one that kept us in it single-handedly at times, um, particularly with the ball. And I think hearing that he'd had, you know, some issues happening off the field, to be able to compartmentalise that and put that to one side and then still step out in the field while he was going through so many issues off the field was just a remarkable effort. Um, it, it says a lot about his character and his strength of character to be able to manage both scenarios and still be magnificent at his, at his job, which was to, to play cricket for Australia, and he did it so well. I think there's no doubt he, he kept leg spin, or well, the art of leg spin bowling alive, particularly when he first burst on the scene and, and obviously with the gadding ball and all that. But I think that, you know, it's going to keep going on for generation and generation because I think, I know when the news broke the other morning and I rang home, my 11-year-old son, who bowls leggies, uh, he, was, he started crying because he realised that he was never going to meet Warney and he, and he desperately wanted to meet Warney and unfortunately I never got around to organising that for him. But I think that just highlights that, you know, it doesn't matter um, what generation it is, Warney's legacy will remain for the history of the game and for centuries to come because in my mind and I think in a lot of Australians' minds, he was the greatest there was um, from a leg spin perspective. People might say we're biased because we were teammates of his, but I think his record speaks for itself. And um, it's not just about his numbers. It's about, to me, it's about the fact that he helped make Australian cricket one of the greatest teams in the history of the game through his era. And I think as teammates, we were all very blessed to see that firsthand and, and be a part of it. Uh, let, let's talk about some of the standout memories we have of, of Warren, the cricketer. Um, Joe, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I had a, a couple. The first one is from the 05 Ashes, and yeah, everyone will remember it, but it's particularly the end of that Trent Bridge test, which you know England effectively won won the game, only had any target whatsoever to chase because Warren had slapped it around with the bat for a 40-odd or 40 balls. Uh, and then I think in reply, England raced to about 30, 30 to none, uh, only chasing 130. So the game, the game is up. Warren comes on, and suddenly it is a completely different game. He gets Triscothic, he gets Warren, and suddenly 130 looks like, as an England fan, it's like, well, they're not going to get there. How could they? They can't possibly get there. And you can see the England batters as well are thinking the same. Geraint Jones just basically completely loses his head, runs down the track, tries to hit him over the top because he's lost it. And of that spell, there are a couple of balls that stick in my mind, but that more than any other one did seem to be worn the, the, winning the psychological battle over England they just completely lost it if if Warren could have bowled from both ends in that final innings England were all out for 60 basically yeah. I mean they, they just couldn't get around them they just all they could do was hope to survive and then they did and that I guess that was fairly typical of that 05 series which Australia lost but but Warren was at his best in some ways and you know it's, it was I think it was Gilchrist afterwards who said I said to Shane how many do you need and Warren said 160, and they gave him 130, <laughs> and they won. And England won by three wickets. Yeah, it always felt like an upset that England chased 130 with Warren bowling the way he was that yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. And, and then the other one, which is more personal, but um, and from less a game of less fanfare, a totes bought 45 over game in uh, 2004. Um, uh, an old mate of mine, Simon Cousden, who played a few games for Kent, England under 19s, Derbyshire. Um, got a call on I think it was a Sunday night to say that he was going to be playing against Hampshire at the the Rose Bowl as it was then uh, the next day so me um, my mate my dad took the day off work went down to Southampton to watch Simon play against Hampshire so first outing in professional cricket which is exciting enough as it is uh, he comes out to bat at, I think number nine possibly number 10 
And he's facing Shane Warne. This is the first ball he's faced in professional cricket. And he's got Shane Warne standing at the other end. And it was just, I mean, obviously it was incredible for him, but it was incredible for me. It's like going and seeing uh, like your, your mate your mate's new band play at a pub and he's on stage with Elvis, basically. It was just, <laughs> it was ludicrous to see this bloke that I was, I opened the bowling with Simon for the school team the year before and now he's up against <laughs> Shane Warne, um, who he saw out a maiden in, well, saw out, he got beaten five times in a row, I think. Uh, Warne gave him a volley of abuse and uh, then he had his leg stump taken out by Tremlett in the next over and just came off absolutely beaming for him. It was the greatest experience <laughs> of his life. Uh, and it was yeah astonishing to to see there and be part of it also even more so because it was a midweek game almost no one there it just the whole feeling felt so so bizarre um but yeah yeah moment I'll never forget yeah I think for me one of my first I think my first memory of watching cricket was having the 99 world cup video and I used to just watch that on repeat 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 um, and it was worn spell in the semi-final against South Africa that stands out, but particularly the ball to Herschel Gibbs, I don't think gets talked about enough as as one of one of his and one of the great balls. Um, it doesn't talk, talk me through it. Well, it doesn't. It's, it's similar to the Gatting one. Uh, drifts, loads, pitches outside leg, takes the top of off. Gibbs tries to play him through the leg side and misses it by a couple of feet. Um, but the reason why... And that they were losing that game. Yeah, so South Africa were 48 for none, chasing 213. The game at that point, that's South Africa are massive favourites and we all know what happens at the end of that game. Um, but for me, it's it sums worn up perfectly because it was the... I don't think anyone has ever had a greater control of a cricket ball than, than Shane Warne. And there's that element to it, but there's also really standing up like he did at Trent Bridge in a really clutch moment in the game and turns it. Um, and he lets out this enormous roar afterwards. You can kind of feel that if you're playing on the same team, you, you, your belief changes when someone it produces something like that. But then his reaction is, yeah, we, we should be winning this game. You hear that time um, and again from people he played with, particularly the guys he played with at Hampshire, who, mm. you know, were, a lot of them were jobbing county cricketers, who suddenly felt like they were like stars in the making. Mm. And, and that's, that's an astonishing trait in itself as well, not to just believe in yourself but to make other people believe in themselves to a degree they've never reached before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Phil, you got any more? Uh, yeah, loads. <laughs> um, I, I, I was old enough in 93 to remember it, and I remember being in my dad's car when he bowled the Gatting ball, and we were driving somewhere or other, and Trevor Bailey, the, the plummy old Cambridge-educated Trevor Bailey, was on commentary, and this was one of, the, one of those eras of t TMS where no one really knew what was going on. And they were as baffled by it as as you could as any kind of you know sweet old old boy at deep mid wicket watching in the stands would have been. And it was only on replay that Bailey saw what had really happened. And I'll never forget it. He said, "That is an absolute corker, <laughs> a corker." <laughs> and my dad, so I'd never seen Warren Bowl live, but I'd seen I knew of him because I was already subscribing to the cricket magazines and all the rest of it. And he'd taken seven for fifty odd. A month or three before that at Melbourne against the West Indies, having had no kind of career before that. And then he took seven for on the final day um, and he clean bowled Richardson with a, a slider, possibly an accidental slider. Who's to say? But it was one of those classic warns where you're on the back foot and it slides through and, you know, you hit on the pad. In fact, he was bowled in this instance. But anyway, he took seven for 50 warn that day. But, he, but before that, you know, he was, he was nowhere really. Um, Border, the visionary captain, backed him enough to take him onto that tour, but I'd never seen it. And I remember my dad in the car explaining to me, obviously picking up a bit more knowledge than I had at the time about exactly what had happened and why it was so important, why it was so significant. I remember that conversation very vividly. <coughs> and I remember being living through that summer uh, and then throwing it all the way to the end. I was as I said earlier, really lucky. I saw the 700th at Melbourne when on a freezing cold, weirdly freezing cold Boxing Day morning in his home town uh, in front of literally 100,000. And there, there I was in, with my collar up, you know, freezing cold. And um, England got to 30 odd, I don't know, something like that, 30 or 40 odd. Strauss was playing nicely. Uh, and... Strauss played inexplicably all round a conventional worn leg break. 
all round it, tried to hit it through mid-wicket in the first hour, hour and a half. And it was almost like... And Warren took five for 30 without bowling a ball that you'd remember. Mm. And talking about bending the, the moment to, to his will, uh, which is the theme that runs through, and with all the great players, that was that. Was that. You know, there was no way that anybody could stand in the way. Man or beast was not able to stand in Warren's way that day. Mm. He could have bowled a, half a dozen long ops and he'd have taken six for 30. It was that kind of day. And just to be there, as I say, in his in his beer garden, basically, uh, that was that was a very very privileged and special thing. And and I happened to be at Sydney as well when he when he he, you know, Morecambe and Wise style and just you know skipped off into the sunset with McGrath, you know. So I, I felt like I, from an Ashes story, I was there at the start, and I was damn lucky to have seen it right at the end as well. Mm. Um, obviously, there, there are too many memories to, to go through in, in detail, but one that I don't remember, but I've seen on Twitter in the last few days, is this amazing moment from an ODI between England and Australia at the MCG in, I think, I think 98, 99. Um, basically, the crowd are behaving very badly and they're throwing rubbish onto the field, so much so that the game had to be stopped. And they were basically the umpires and the players on the field, Australia were batting at the time. We're like, what, what do we do? We can't play with this much rubbish being thrown onto the field. Alex Stewart then gestures to the Australian dressing room. He just gestures the leg break motion to kind of beckon Warren over. So Warren kind of like um, wow. jog, 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 jogs out in his training gear. Um, and uh, I think Stewart explains what needs to be done. Basically, they calm them down. And Warren kind of like, uh, with, a, with a big grin on his face, walks towards the crowd, he finds a helmet on the floor, puts the helmet on, walks over, <laughs> walks over the crowd and is like, calm down, lads, come on, come on. And then they they behave perfectly fine. Oh, that's marvellous. Um, like you, you call it his playground. It, he very much was the king of king, king of the MCG. Smart thinking from the gaffer there as well. Yeah, it is. But also, <laughs> that's, that's the gaffer's finest moment. <laughs> yeah. The universal gesture <laughs> yeah, of the yeah, legger. Yeah, yeah. Get him out. But also the way the way Stuart did it was just like, obviously this is what we do. Like, mm. we, we can't control the crowd. Mm. Obviously we get worn on. Yeah. He'll sort it out. Um, that's marvellous. That is marvellous. Um, just 93, this is, this is a nothing thing. But I remember as well watching, I think it was on a Saturday afternoon, Adam Hollyoak getting you know, infamously, famously getting, leaving one and getting, <laughs> yeah. and getting trapped um, with another sort of slider type zooter we don't exactly know. Uh, but I'd never seen that happen either. I'd never, I didn't just not seen that in, in cricket because you hadn't seen in England. I was too young to have seen Abdul Qadir. Pakistani great in 87 who came over here. You know, I was too young for that. So I'd never seen a leggy, a proper actual leggy. I'd certainly never seen somebody pad up to what they're expecting is something to turn sideways and get, you know, end up with first, first slips hands and just get cleaned up middle and leg, or middle and off rather. I've certainly never seen that before. Yeah. And so you were, you were just seeing these international cricketers reduced to like jester figures in, in his court. Uh, yeah, look, it was. It, it's been a very funny few days, but everything is just so vivid suddenly. Mm. You know, I'm really glad you mentioned his batting um, because I always thought he he batted with an air of someone who was you know, he had the confidence of someone who actually averaged like 45 with the bat. And there were moments where you like actually really fearful as, as like an England fan. You like 2005 Ashes, like oh shit, warns him. Um, oh, but he, he could play. Yeah, I don't, I'm, yeah, yeah. Natural timer of the ball. Um, well, yeah, if he doesn't stand on his stumps, then the Ashes are Australia's. Yeah, yeah, Seems absolutely. Um, let's hear Mark Butch's reflections on Warren. Butch played against Warren for over a decade, and he details his first encounter against Warren, which was a first-class game that predates his delivery to Gatting in 1993. Hi, Butch. Uh, I think Warren's death obviously came as a huge shock to, to all of us, even though you didn't know him all that well you, you did know him and it was such a sudden thing uh how are you doing now how are you feeling has it has it sunk in at all or is it going to take a while for it to kind of feel real do you think um <clears throat> it certainly didn't feel real at the time you know it was kind of we're scrambling around looking for um trying to find the punchline on uh on uh, on friday um yeah, I mean, I you know, I kind of I I was getting to know him a lot better. You know, we spent a bit more time um, together in, in, in uh, the Sky commentary box over the last year or so, um, and obviously had played you know played against him many many times either for um, for England or when he was at Hampshire. So you know, it was, it's somebody that kind of loomed large 
um, for anybody that was that's involved in cricket, really, let alone people who had a more sort of personal relationship with them. Um, I, I guess that, that it's just that somebody that was so, so vibrant and so full of life, and, you know, you hear it often, you know, when people pass away before their time, um, you know, about how sort of, um, you know, how sort of energising that they were and everything, and all of that stuff um, counts for, for shame worn and, you know, add, add another ton, you know, it's just an extraordinarily, um, alive, uh, and, um, and, and vibrant human being, you know, he had, he had his, he had his faults as, as we all do. He had, but, but, but what he did have was this ability to kind of, to, to raise a room, you know, to raise not only a room, you know, 90 odd thousand people at the MCG, he kind of had everybody in the palm of his hand when he was center of attention. Um, and he was nearly always center of attention. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's try and go through sort of how, how you knew Warren, I suppose. Uh, let's start with you as a player. I was looking, I think only Glenn McGrath got you out more often in test cricket than Warren did. Uh, what was he like okay. as, a, as a competitor on the field? I mean, people sort of talk about him sort of getting inside your head and getting you out before he'd actually got you out sort of thing. Is that, is that kind of what it was like? Yeah, I think that's, that's fairly accurate. I mean, the first time I've, I've played against him um, was in a tour match, Australia versus Surrey or Surrey versus Australia all the way back in 93. So um, he, was, he was pretty much unknown. And, you know, the, there wasn't anywhere near the sort of analysis of, of video and, and all the rest of it that, that is done nowadays back then. And so, you know, they, they tossed the ball to this, this sort of slightly, slightly round um, spiky haired blonde bloke with a with a with an earring and I think I was batting at seven or eight I was batting down the order playing as a bowler probably and um, I remember him bowling this delivery round the wicket to the left hand and bowling this ball and it pitched almost on the you know just on the cup strip just on it outside my off stump and I kind of you know just sort of <clears throat> thrust a pad out at it to you know to try and cover the spin and it's turned and bounced and gone shot over my right shoulder so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm sort of padding up right foot out, way outside off stump and it shoots over my right shoulder. <clears throat> and I think, I think Tim Zura might've been keeping wicket. You'd have to check that. It was either Zura or Healy takes this ball miles up here. And I've just kind of gone, what, <laughs> what the hell was that? You know, I've never, ever seen a ball turn like that before. Um, and you know, that's obviously a precursor to, to, um, to, to the ball of the century, I suppose. So that was the very first time I'd, I'd, um, I'd ever encountered him. Um, and then I suppose, you know, you then sort of fast forward, uh, having watched, um, you know, England teams going to, you know, really struggle against him, obviously from the, the ball of the century through that, that tour. And then the, the, the 90, 2000 or 94, 95 series, I was in Australia. I was living in Melbourne, um, playing for South Melbourne um, in grade cricket. I remember just watching him have England on toast in that, uh, in that series. Um, you know, the flipper was working back then, you know, he had all the entire box of tricks in those, in those early days and was, um, you know, it was just compelling to watch. Uh, and so you're kind of watching this and thinking, crikey, what, what happens if I get picked for England? How am I going to go about playing, playing against this? Um, and then, you know, so fast forward to, to whatever, 97, where I make my, my test debut. Now, the first day sort of test cricket or the first two days of test cricket, we kind of, um, you know, we, we bowled Australia out for 110. Warren made a really belligerent 20 odd to get them up above 100, um, you know, slogging it around. And then um, Nasser and, uh, and, and Thorpe sort of dealt with him and everything else that the Australians threw at him at Edgbaston in that first test match. So, um, you know, it wasn't until probably at, at Lords, um, you know, I'm, I made 80 in the, in the second innings. And he bowled me out. I tried to hit, hit him through extra cover against the spin, got a little bit cocky and, you know, was looking to try and make my first test match 100 and kind of just played it on, you know, even looking back at it now, it's like a really bad calculation trying to hit against that amount of spin and got bowled through the gate. Um, and then, and then um, you know, and then at Old Trafford, he, he bowled us out properly on a, t on a pitch that had dried out after starting off wet. Um, and... Um, you know, and then and then really started to turn in that second innings, and that's when you started to 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 see close up, just just how good he he was. Um, <clears throat> and then you know later on in, in my career, then sort of you know I I got a chance to play against Shane in uh, in county cricket, which was nice because you kind of it was less rarefied. 
there didn't seem to be quite so much pressure on it. It didn't mean that he bowled any differently or, or took it any easier, but you just kind of had a little bit more mind space to try and figure out what you were going to got, what, what you were trying to do and what he was doing. Um, you know, so the delivery that, that was really, uh, the, you know, the smoke and mirrors about Shane Warne was there's a guy with no googly, the flipper had stopped by then as well because of the, the, the shoulder injury. And so what you saw was that varying degrees of leg spin and a ball that went straight. And that was pretty much it by then. Um, and so that there was a lot of a lot of smoke and mirrors, and a lot of that was based around his his sort of mastery of the of the theatre of it all. So you know he'd come on to bowl, and it'd take him forever to set his field. It'd take him forever to kind of bowl the first ball. He was kind of building up this anticipation, and then the field would move maybe a centimetre one way or six inches another, and you're kind of standing there going, "Well, why why is he why is he doing that? Why is he making such a big deal of doing that?" And so, you know, immediately the brain is starting to think, well, he's setting me up for something here. And, and it probably wasn't, but that's kind of, and that was how um, he had command of, of, of the people that he was playing against and the arena that he was, that he was playing in. Um, and, you know, by the time we got to, you know, to 2001 and then 2005, where he probably bowled as well as he ever did, um, 2005, he was just, just so completely in control of what he was doing. I mean, it wasn't as though he, he was struggling before, but 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 by then the mastery of the, the entire art was was um, was supreme, um, and you know it's just an absolute privilege to have played so many games of cricket against somebody that good, you know, um, and to have had you know had had the odd day where it kind of went my way and, and tons more where it didn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, where, where does he rank among, I suppose, spinners that you played against? It would have been him and him and Murray, I suppose. Yeah, I'm, well. I mean, Murley would posed his own sort of set of rather, rather unpleasant problems as well. Um, however, I mean, I think simply because, and I've seen other people write this as well. You know, Athens played against them both a lot, and, and and lots of people did. That Shane, when 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 things when things appeared to be going in your in your favour, when you when the game seemed to be on your side, Shane was much was much better at kind of wrestling that back, I think. I mean, there's not a great deal in it, mind. But I, I think in terms, of, in terms of his kind of his nous and his understanding of what the batters are trying to do and, 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 the, and the, whole, um, the whole course of, of changing the matches or trying to get inside batsman's head, he had that advantage over Murley. Um, you know, you're splitting hairs a bit between two great ones, but you you always felt, you know, Murley that the the physical thing of Murley was was the challenge, I suppose, the, the physicality of the, the distances that he was turning the ball, the 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 wrong and you know as he got as he got older and all that kind of stuff and, and the difficulty that that posed, the, the ridiculous angles. Um, with Shane, there was just that there was that little bit extra, um, and and some and to some people that that's unquantifiable. I'm sure to us Sri Lankan fans, I say, you know, I'm talking absolute nonsense. But there was, but there was a there was a, there was a something else. Um, with Shane Warne that just, for me anyway, put him above um, Murley. Yeah, and there's obviously loads of stories of him off the field during his playing days. Just, just not, not, not so much the uh, the ones that made the headlines, but just him in a dressing room at the end of a game or a series having a beer. Is is that is that what you experienced? Basically, that he played hard and did everything to get you out on the field, and then was pretty fun off it. Basically, yeah, he was he was he was he was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, he he kind of. You know the the beer thing perhaps is a little bit of a, 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 a another piece of smoke and mirrors really. He wasn't he wasn't a massive drinker at least not beers anyway. Um, but he was very sociable and, and was always always wanted to talk cricket. Would always you know have a million and one stories of stuff going on outside cricket. But if you wanted to talk to him about something to do with the game, he was just you know he came even more alive and was um, was always willing to share um, share his thoughts and uh, and whatever else. Um, and, uh, you know, he absolutely, and, and again, Murley's the same here. Ab both of them absolutely love the game of cricket. I mean, they're just absolute badgers for it. You'd imagine that sort of being as, as great as they were, they're kind of, you know, you know I'd pack, the, pack my boots away at the end of the day and want to want to do something else or talk about something else. But they'd be, you know, the pair of them, uh, and Warney, and Warney to, to an extraordinary extent, absolutely love the game, love the, love the, um, you know the strategy of it. Love the 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 idea of um, you know trying to get one better on the, the opposition or on an entire nation, as it was with England or whatever it might be. The tactical um, differences and and the tactical changes that needed to be made to be able to wrestle away one situation from another. Um, and and let's not also forget that the fact how often 
Shane Vaughan sort of put himself front and centre stage in order to kind of to be the person that would make a difference in a situation that, that other people might have shrunk away from. Um, I think all of those things sort of combine to, to, to make him the, the force that he was as a cricketer. Yeah, and how was that as an England player playing at home against Australia when, you know, you've got all these lots of great players on your side, but almost like the main event is always this guy on the opposition who's kind of like a, a pantomime villain, but also loved by the English fans in equal measure. Is that... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that is absolutely true. I mean, there's, there's that story, isn't there, 2005, where, where the fans are getting stuck into him after dropping KP and, mm. you know, they, they end up singing to him that it's only because they wish he was English type of thing, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, look, the, the challenge of playing against him was great enough. So you kind of had the rest of it you had to sort of put out, put out of your mind. Um, but, but I think what, what he did for the, for, the, for the rest of us, in fact, for all the, the mere mortals on the field was kind of, you know, he kind of, he gave, he gave cricket um, this, uh, this glamour, I suppose, this injection of kind of being um, something that was worth watching, even if you weren't a, a, a cricket fan. Um, and and that, that excitement is rare from, from cricketers, you know, <clears throat> both of them had, had a similar type of aura um, <clears throat> Lara, at, at his very best, had, had that sort of aura as well, whereby everybody kind of wanted to stop what they were doing and, and, and watch because this man was involved. Um, so, of course, if you're, if you're at the other end of that and it kind of it, it goes OK for you, then, then you know, the, the, you, you get a bit of the reflected spotlight um, from that. Um, but but what, what was incredibly difficult, I suppose, was this feeling that once he did get, once he got his teeth into a situation, once he kind of found, you know, found the perfect pace for the pitch, um, you know, he was always calculating what's the what's the perfect pace. How you know where where how far outside leg stump can I go? What, how much drift am I going to be able to get? Once he kind of locked into the sort of like the perfect the perfect sort of style for that particular day on that particular surface, it was unbelievably difficult to stop the momentum when it went when it went his way. You know, he just it just turned into this you know, the tiny little snowball rolling down the hill. And then before you knew it, it was the size of a house and just knocking everything over in its wake. And that was, and the crowd got involved in that too. You know, that became, um, you know, everybody was going along with that apart from the people stood in front of it. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned at the start, you've worked quite a lot alongside him. What, what was he like to, to be in a commentary box with? Um, a, a lot of fun, you know, um, again, and that's notwithstanding the, the, the things I've said before about his, his sort of his absolute love of the game and wanting to be, um, you know, wanting to be inside the minds of all of the players and, and to try and to bring to br- try and bring that insight out. But but more often than not, it was you know he he wanted to he wanted to be having fun. He wanted the people at home to be kind of sensing that he was in, he was enjoying himself and that that um, uh, you know that it wasn't the it, even though it was the it was the most important thing, and he you know without cricket, we wouldn't you know the, the whole personality of Shane Warne nobody would know anything about. But it, 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 he also treated it like <clears throat> treated it as it was, which is as a game. You know, it, it's not life and death. It's none of these things are in the grand scheme of things are, are, are that important. Um, so it's there to be enjoyed and um, and, and to 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 be milked for all of the amusement that, that can be found. Yeah. Okay. And the, the the final thing I kind of wanted to ask was about his uh, like his his legacy, which seems a weird thing to ask because he was so sort of much of a presence that his legacy was already kind of set even while he was playing. But I mean, it's impossible to to overstate really. I mean, revive legs been I mean, revive cricket in some ways, didn't he? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I suppose the, the the contradictory thing about the whole thing was that he was supposed to sort of start off this this avalanche of sort of leg break bowlers in, in world cricket and test matches in particular, we know how um, ubiquitous it's become in, in terms of one day cricket, largely because of the format, you know, because of T20 making, making that style of bowler very, very um, effective indeed. But the, the contradiction, I suppose, in all of that is that it didn't work. He, he was so great at it that kind of nobody has been, <laughs> nobody's been able to get close, you know, to living up to that, uh, to that kind of um, that sort of excellence in what is the most difficult, you know, difficult of arts um, potentially in the game, or at least as a bowler, anyway. And so, um, 
you know, I mean, legacy wise, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting thing. I, I think that perhaps the, 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 the nicest or the thing that he might enjoy most on his, <clears throat> on his headstone would be that he made cricket cool again. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's, that pretty much sums it up. Let's finish with some of those beautiful emails from, from the listeners. They, they really are um, very special. Um, ben wrote, like many, my first experience of cricket was the 2005 Ashes. I was nine years old and I was watching from my, na- from, I was watching from my nan's house. Normally I demand that we'd watch football, but the satellite dish was broken and we only had terrestrial TV. As I watched on, I started to ask more questions and developed a basic understanding of the game. My uncle would point out individuals and tell me stories about their legacy and careers up to that point. One by one, I had a profile of the Australian team attack and the English batsman. Then, all of a sudden, rather than running, someone started walking into bowl. My uncle concluded his player-by-player profile by saying, now, this is Shane Warne. Like everyone who's ever watched Shane Warne bowl, whether at the time or in retrospect, I was completely transfixed and my love for cricket was born. Shane Warne not only gave me a love for cricket, but a sense of comfort that will stay but a sense of comfort that will stay with me for as long as I live. Because cricket, whether the spectacle itself or the analysis and coverage, brings me a sense of safety and community. Mm. Thanks for making that possible, Shane. Rest well. That's beautiful. I hadn't read that. Yeah. Um, and I liked we, a lot of our emails were from different parts of the world. This one's from Harris in Pakistan, who says, My earliest memories of Warren take me back to the early 2000s in Pakistan, in our veranda, me trying to bowl like him with a taped tennis ball. At a, time when high, at a time when I hardly knew any cricketer outside Pakistan. As a kid, I couldn't take my eyes off a of TV when he was bowling in a test match. It was such a joy just to watch him go about his work. And it always seemed like there was more to the game when he was the one playing it. He wasn't just a cricketer. He's an absolute performance artist and a truly transcendental figure. Rest in peace, King. Uh, this one's from Andrew. It's hard to know what to write or what to feel. I was only 12 when the 2005 Ashes were taking place, but I was utterly gripped. Mesmerised by the theatre, the spectacle, the eufor- euphoria, I was swept off my feet by Vaughan, Peterson, Flintoff and the like. But still, even in defeat, Vaughan had me spellbound. I've rewatched the DVDs at least 15 times and it never fails to amaze me. His smile, the flick of the ball, the slow amble and the, re- and the release are captivating. I would spend hours at my local club or on my drive trying to emulate him. For someone who only caught a glimpse of the twilight of his career, I'm saddened, but upon Friday's, but upon Friday's events, I'm honoured. What really summed him up was after the Peterson was dismissed at the Oval on that last day, Warren was the first to run up and shake his hand. Even in defeat, after being the best player in the series, he was gracious and he was a gent. He played hard, but he played fair and respected anyone that did the same. A truly captivating artist, I don't think we'll see the light of which again. Well, bold chain. This one's from an Australian listener, Richard. And I'd like the start of this one. I love the podcast. I always enjoy listening to the effects of years of mental disintegration inflicted on the English psyche over the past 30 years. <laughs> Shane Warne had a massive pa- part to play in that. I'm a 55-year-old from Melbourne, so Warne has played a significant role in my cricketing life. To see the way he took leg spin from being an afterthought performed by dweebs on only the driest and most unresponsive wickets to lead the attack with skill and aggression was to witness a complete transformation in the way the game was played. Kids in my generation wanted to be Dennis Lilly. Suddenly every kid was bowling leg spin. Rodney Hogg had a column in a local newspaper. After seeing a young Warren play in a club game, he wrote that he would take over 500 test wickets. He was sacked for being ridiculous. <laughs> With hindsight, Hogg undersold him. The Gatting Ball announced a massive talent onto the world stage, but he was more than skilled. He thought batsmen out by understanding them better than they understood themselves and playing to their strengths and weaknesses. I was at the MCG for his hat-trick, his 700th wicket, and many more wonderful moments. There was always a sense of expectation when he was introduced to the bowling crease. He made things happen. He never let a game drift. A true genius with character flaws like many champions before him, but so good for the game. Everyone wanted to be Shane Warne at different times. His commentary was always interesting. I disagreed often, but he knew and loved the game well and his views always came from a good place. He knew his game, his position in the game was solidified. He just wanted to improve it and be available to kids all over the world. An all-time great, although I never met him, I feel a tremendous sense of loss today. 
He was unique and will be sorely missed. This one's from Adrian. You might remember Adrian. He's our loyal listener from France who wrote in uh, a couple of months ago. Like everyone else, I'm in shock and it's com- and it's complicated to manage when you live in a country where almost no one knows who Shane Warne is. I heard the news when I was at the cinema the other day from my cricket club's WhatsApp group. When you come from a country like mine where cricket is not part of your culture and you start to take an interest in it, which champions do you quickly come across? Virat Kohli, MS Dhoni certainly, Brian Lara, who had a game in his name. But I can assure you the first spectacular videos that I came across were those of Shane Warne. And I was able to verify this thought when, by posting a few videos of Warren on my social networks, friends who have no interest in the sport have interacted with what they were seeing. And this magical side to Warren was something that could touch anyone, and that was very, very precious. It is players like Warren who make cricket a delight for connoisseurs, but also a wonderful discovery for novices. Um, and just finally, I'd like to recommend the Amazon documentary on Warren that came out only a, a few weeks ago. Um, and I wanted to finish the show by just saying with what just saying what Warren said at the very end of the documentary. I liked loud music. I smoked. I drank, and I bowled a bit of leg spin. That was me. I don't have any regrets. Rest in peace, Shane. <laughs>